So back when I was drinking, I used to suffer with terrible sleep. And if you're a drinker, I'm sure you have as well. Scientists have found that over 90% of drinkers struggle with their sleep, and the script is more or less similar for all of them. So today in this video, you're going to find out exactly what a good night's sleep looks like compared to that of a drunken one. I'll also break down what you can expect when you stop drinking alcohol, and most importantly, we'll be looking at just how critical sleep is to your overall well-being. Some of the health implications of chronic sleep problems will shock you. Stay tuned. And ladies and gentlemen, just before we get into the video, if you want to access a free video training showing you the strangest secret to controlling alcohol without AA, without willpower, without rehabs, click the link in the description. On that page, you'll enter your name and email address, then you're going to get instant access to that training video. So if you want to be able to control your drinking, make sure to watch that video after watching this one, and let's get back to the video. So first, let's look at the different stages of sleep. So interestingly, a good night's sleep doesn't follow a nice straight line. Rather, our sleep progresses in cycles. Now, on average, each cycle lasts for 90 minutes, and we go through three to five cycles a night. Each cycle has four different stages. The first stage of light sleep lasts up to five minutes, the second stage up to 60 minutes, and the third stage, also called deep sleep stage, lasts up to 40 minutes. When we're at this stage, we're at our most difficult to wake up. The fourth and final stage is REM sleep, short for rapid eye movement. This is when we have dreams, and it's actually one of the lighter sleep stages. As the night goes on, the REM stage occupies more and more of each sleep cycle. This happens at the expense of the other three cycles. To give you an idea, we have our first REM stage of the night around 90 minutes after we fall asleep, and that will only last for around 10 minutes. Right before we wake up though, the last REM stage might last as long as one hour. Now, drinking disrupts the relative proportions of these various stages. During the first half of the night, alcohol suppresses REM sleep. The space that would normally be taken by REM sleep is instead occupied by deep sleep. But during the second half of the night, these effects reverse. Light sleep in the form of REM is boosted at the expense of deep sleep. And because we're more likely to wake up in light sleep, drinkers tend to wake up more during the second half of the night. And there's another reason for this, which I'll get to shortly. Now, this two-sided effect of alcohol on sleep is a recurring theme. You get one effect of the first half of the night and its opposite in the second half. Apart from messing up our sleep cycles, the immediate effect of alcohol is to make us sleepy. Now, this is because alcohol is a central nervous system depressant. It slows down the brain's activity, leading to temporary relaxation and drowsiness. Because of this, alcohol can shorten the so-called sleep latency, which is the amount of time between when you lie down in bed and the moment that you actually fall asleep. But we saw earlier how drinking leads to light sleep during the second half of the night. This increases the probability of waking up. But there is another reason drinkers are more likely to wake up during the second half of the night, dehydration. Now, as you're probably aware, beer makers love to use images of cold beers in a bucket of ice to quench thirst. But the reality is, is that the more beer you drink or the more alcohol you drink, the thirstier that you will soon become. Wine, spirits, whatever, it makes no difference. Now, why exactly is this? Well, this is because alcohol has a diuretic effect, meaning it makes us urinate more frequently. Alcohol's diuretic effect is due to it suppressing an antidiuretic hormone called vasopressin. Without sufficient vasopressin in the system, the kidneys can't reabsorb water into the body. Instead, they send it directly to the bladder. The diuretic effect of alcohol is so strong that we lose almost four times as much liquid as we gain through consuming alcoholic drinks. The end result is frequent visits to the toilet. Scientists call this nighttime urination nocturia, and it can obviously ruin your sleep. A corollary of this dehydration is the hangover the following day. The hangover is simply our body's organs taking water from their brain in a desperate attempt to compensate for their water loss. The urination also disrupts our sodium and potassium levels levels, which are necessary to the normal function of our nerves and muscles. Now, having said all of this, you won't be surprised to learn that insomnia and other sleep disturbances are one of the most common health concerns of problem drinkers. Estimates for the percentage of heavy drinkers who report persistent sleep problems range widely from a low of 36% 
to a whopping high of 91%. Most studies find a rate of around 75%. So we're looking at roughly three quarters of all problem drinkers suffering from poor sleep. To make things worse, over the years, our body builds up tolerance to alcohol's sedative effects, meaning problem drinkers don't even get the benefits of a deeper sleep during the first half of the night. But what happens if you stop drinking alcohol? As you'd expect, the body needs some time to adjust, meaning the sleep problems are actually magnified for the first one to two weeks after the last drink. For example, a 2009 study with Brazilian inpatients undergoing alcohol detoxification found that 100% of women and 90% of men suffered from sleep disturbances during this time. This acute phase of alcohol withdrawal gives way to a more moderate phase, which lasts for about five weeks. Around two out of three people will experience sleep disturbances during this time. So why does all of this matter? Well, sleep is a fundamental physiological process that is critical to our immune, hormonal, and cardiovascular systems. When our sleep suffers, the entire body suffers. We all know from our everyday life the short-term consequences of disrupted sleep. Increased stress, emotional distress, cognitive deficits, weak work performance and behavioral changes, including mood swings and irritability. In a nutshell, the day after a poor night's sleep is one that we often chalk down to the category of wasted days. This is something that we all understand. But something that many people don't appreciate is the long-term consequences of this disrupted sleep. In other words, all the diseases that you are more likely to develop if your sleep is chronically deprived or disrupted. These include, amongst others, hypertension and cardiovascular disease, impaired metabolism, type 2 diabetes, and even weight gain. There is also some evidence that sleep disruption and deprivation, which might accelerate the formation of certain tumors, leading to an increased risk of cancer. For example, long-term data from night shift workers shows that they increase their probability of colorectal cancer by 35%. This is in comparison with people who work regular daytime shifts. Other studies have found that men with long-term sleep problems are twice as likely to develop prostate cancer. Unsurprisingly, after all we've just discussed, long-term sleep problems are also associated with higher all-cause mortality and lower life expectancy. Pretty interesting stuff. Have a great day.